Good afternoon and welcome to another moment with Madison. Spring of 1788 found me still in New York City working with Congress. My friends were calling me back to Virginia to defend the Constitution, the ratifying convention, but I was not looking forward to navigating those roads during the March floods. Still, I had no choice. Richard Henry Lee, the Virginian who had declared that we ought to be free and independent states, now opposed the Constitution, calling on Congress for amendments. Trying to amend the Constitution before it was even ratified would be a death knell. Thirteen different states with thirteen different sets of amendments, we would die in committee. George Washington had asked me to stop at Mount Vernon on my way down. We talked about the convention and his optimism for ratification. I was not so sanguine. On June the 3rd, 168 men took their places in the theater on Shaco Hill in Richmond. The opposition was led by my mentor and former hero, Patrick Henry. He had not attended the Constitutional Convention, famously declaring, I smell a rat. He now intended to scuttle the results. Joining him were George Mason, with whom I had revised the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and James Monroe, a hero from the war who was once described as everything in a man that a woman could desire. The first day began with the usual rulemaking and George Mason demanding that the Constitution be debated clause by clause. I could not think of a better way to address the issue. We had just spent the entire summer debating those clauses in excruciating detail. And then I spent the fall reiterating those arguments in the Federalist. I stood and gave my full approbation. Uh, Mr. Mason Mason did not seem pleased. The following day, Patrick Henry took the floor demanding to know by what right we had used the words we the people and not we the states. This is uh, ironic in as much as the initial draft of the Constitution did say we the states. It was Governor Morris who changed those words in the preamble at the very end, and nobody had the energy to challenge him. Still, it was a foolish attack, and Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph stood to retort, <clears throat> If the government is to be binding upon the people, are not the people the proper persons to examine its merits or defects? Not only did this push back on Henry, but it became clear that Randolph, who had refused to sign the Constitution, now supported it wholeheartedly. Henry was not amused and continued his attacks on the Constitution. It was radical. It was a relinquishment of rights. It squinted towards monarchy. The convention's note-taker was so overwhelmed by Henry's barrage of invectives that at one point he simply noted, <coughs> Here Mr. Henry strongly and pathetically expatiated on the probability of the President's enslaving America and the horrid consequences that must result. <laughs> As we got into the specifics of the debate, the day would begin with Henry or Mason or Monroe finding reason for grave concerns and me refuting them. It was exasperating, exhausting work. A single gesture from Henry could turn mine on a topic I had just spent an hour explaining. On the 6th, I was taken by one of my fits and forced to remove myself from the convention for several days. I wrote Hamilton, My health is not good, and the business is wearisome beyond expression. As wearisome as it was, my words were being heard. As one observer wrote, <clears throat> Notwithstanding Mr. Henry's declamatory powers, they are being vastly overpowered by the deep reasoning of our glorious little Madison. <laughs> a portion of a letter Thomas Jefferson had written became public. 
with his area proposal that nine states ought ratify and four states ought refuse until a Bill of Rights was amended. American politics is so simple when you're in France. Still, many people did desire a Bill of Rights, so I declared that I would introduce just such a bill after ratification. On the 24th, the final day of discussion, Patrick Henry Rose, <clears throat> Madison. He tells you of important blessings which he imagines will result to us from the adoption of this system. I see the awful immensity of the dangers with which it is pregnant. I see it. I feel it. Beings of a higher order concerned about our decision. We have it in our power to secure the happiness of one half of the human race. At this most sensitive moment, a storm arose. It grew dark. The doors came to with a rebound like a peal of musketry. The windows rattled, the huge wooden structure shrocked, the rain fell from the eaves and torrents, which were dashed against the glass, the thunder roared. Was this God expressing his concerns? Many people believed it, but, but if so, what was he expressing? As the storm subsided, so did Patrick Henry's influence. The vote was taken the following day, and the Constitution won 89 to 79. I sent an express writer, Hamilton and Poughkeepsie, where their convention was being held. A month later, New York also ratified by an equally minuscule margin. The citizens of New York City did not wait for the official announcement, but held a grand parade on the 23rd of July, including a 27-foot frigate built on a wagon and hauled down Wall Street. Behold the Federal Ship of Fame. The Hamilton, we call her name, to every craft she gives employ, Sir Cartman have their share of joy. Alas, Alexander did not get to see it. He was still in Poughkeepsie finishing the paperwork. With the 11 states ratifying, there was no other possible course of action for North Carolina and <clears throat> Wrong Island who ratified two years later, the United States was a country. And we shall discuss that more in the next moment with Madison.